Hi, thanks for uh, joining me for this video presentation on the decline of violence. It's all a little bit different uh, with our social isolations and, and uh, that sort of thing at the moment. So I hope this format works. Um, as this is supposed to be replacing a Bible class, I have tried to loosely stick to that format. Um, so we will uh, start with him. Um, I'll do a prayer uh, and then I'll take us through the discussion that I've prepared on the topic. Um, no, don't worry, I won't be doing the singing myself. Uh, the hymn is actually one uh, that I found on YouTube. Um, uh, we all know it, uh, written by Steph Jamison, called uh, Christ Will Return. Um, so, uh, let's start with that hymn, uh, and then I'll follow that with a prayer.
Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have to meet around your word and to be able to discuss and share ideas about our faith. As we meet together during this time, we are mindful of those who may have tremendous anxiety and fear for what is happening around us all. May it be that activities such as this will help us to reconnect with each other and help us to remain connective and supportive as a community in Christ. May it be that the things we consider in this discussion will help to strengthen our faith and help us to understand your way and your plan and help us to be better prepared not only to serve you but to share the gospel with those around us. And so we ask that you'll hear our prayer and accept the thanks that we offer for we offer it in Jesus name. Amen. So, for this talk, um, I have chosen 1 Thessalonians 5 uh, as my reading. Um, I, I think it's definitely something that's been in the back of my mind through all this. So, although I am going to uh, propose the idea to you that violence has actually declined throughout the world, um, uh, let's not forget what the scriptures say about it. Uh, the, the cry of peace and safety. Um, so anyway, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. Now, concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a, home, for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast to what is good and abstain from every form of evil. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So, let's start our discussion. Um, I always think a, a good way is to ask our research question. What what is the question that we're actually trying to uh, trying to address in our study? Um, so the question I want to look at uh, is is violence on the increase, uh, as we so often assert on the platform. Now this is not a a dig at anybody necessarily, uh, because I think twelve months ago I would have uh, totally agreed with these sayings. Um, 
but I just had a, a quick scan across a couple of Christadelphian websites and these were the sort of uh, sentences and statements uh, that I found. Now, as I said, certainly not taking a dig at anybody because, yes, 12, 12 months ago I would probably either have agreed with this or, or not given it much thought. Um, but when we start to look into some of these sayings, um, it's worth considering, uh, is violence actually increasing? Or when we say these kind of things in public, is what we're saying dinkum or bunkum? Um, and I guess that's the, the question that we've got to address, or that, that I want to address. So what made me start to uh, think about these things um, is because I read a book by a fellow called Steven Pinker. Um, I thought I'd, I wanted something to read on the plane, so I bought a book because it looked like the kind of thing that would while away a couple of hours. Um, and it actually turned out to be a lot more interesting uh, than I expected and a lot more challenging as well. So I spent several months cross-referencing and fact-checking the stuff that he's got in his book. And uh, well, I have to say, I, I think I'm convinced um, that, that violence is actually decreasing. Uh, and the stuff that I'll take you through this evening, uh, well, today in, in this discussion, um, will we'll, we'll show that. Um, look, to, to be fair, um, I think it's one of those things that uh, if I just pop back to our bunkum dinkum graph, there's more to it. It's not, it's not black and white. Um, there are some places where violence is quite high at the moment. Um, and I'm thinking of places like South America, Mexico with the, the drug wars, uh, hotspots in Africa. Um, but there's other places in the world where it's decreased tremendously. So, um, on the whole, a human alive today has a lot less probability of being killed in the violent conflict than at any other time in the past. And so I suppose if that's our ultimate measure, um, then yeah, we have to say that that violence is decreasing. So start with a few pointers um, because these will help to give a little bit of context to some of the things that we, we look at um, as we go through this talk. Um, this is a excerpt from a book called Leviathan, written in the 1600s by a fellow called Thomas Hobbes. Um, that, that's the cover of his book, by the way. Um, but he actually summed up quite nicely why people go to war and why there is violence. Um, and he, he defined it as these three principal causes of quarrel. Um, competition, diffidence, and glory or, or reputation, ego. Uh, the first makes man invade for gain. That's competition. Uh, diffidence for safety or defense, and the third to protect their reputations. Um, and then as that paragraph shows, uh, violence is to make themselves masters of other men's persons, wives, children, and cattle. And the second one is to defend them. And the third is to yeah, protect their, their reputation against anything that they might consider to be almost a different opinion. So why I thought I'd start with this point on Hobbes is because it, his thinking has formed something called the triangle of violence. Um, and what a lot of sociologists have done is use this to define um, the, the actions in aggression. So basically, uh, in any kind of violent situation, there are three parties. Uh, there's the aggressor, uh, there's a victim, and there's the bystander. Now what's happened, uh, as societies became more organized and formed their way from tribes into collectives, into towns, into cities, into states, and so on, basically the state started to form the role of the bystander. And that's why there's this term law here. And what started to happen is that violence basically became 
the um, legitimate use of the state. So think of something like uh, aggressor murders a victim uh, and is then given the death penalty. So there's violence that way, but then there's also the state in, uh, keeps the law uh, by hanging the aggressor. So this um, Hobbes's triangle is something that you'll see reflected in a number of the, the slides that we go through, um, where the state starts to take on a more, uh, if I can call it, an ownership role of violence um, to start to try and uh, control a lot of things um, and, and control the, the activities uh, of between aggressors and victims who may predate uh, and then retaliate. So another point to consider um, is this thing called the empathy circle. Uh, it's covered by um, philosopher Peter Singer in his book, The Expanding Circle. Peter Singer can be a bit of a controversial bloke at times, um, but this is a valid concept where he's talking about the uh, empathy circle. Uh, and as that circle expands, we become more empathetic with that cohort of people uh, and are therefore less inclined to be violent towards them. So through the ages, um, as humanity has connected more and more through exploration, through trade, through whatever means, um, we started to become more empathetic uh, to each other's situations. Um, you just think of what started off as colonization two, three, four hundred years ago, um, where local people were treated basically as second-rate people, um, whereas nowadays uh, there's a lot more consideration given um, and, and, and things have reached a balance. So as that circle expands, we become less inclined to show violence towards people. Um, I, I guess it's worth noting that in some cases today that circle is constricting again as people start to become a bit more nationalistic and a little less uh, tolerant uh, of foreigners or, or people who think differently, people who are in a different circle, empathy circle. So anyway, bringing those two points together, um, I won't necessarily always refer to these again throughout the talk, but just keep them in mind that firstly, this construct of as societies became more, uh, more civilized, more structured, um, a violence, ownership of violence got taken by the state uh, and they used that to sort of control and manage violence between the aggressor and the victim. Um, and uh, the expanding circles of empathy uh, as we became a little bit more uh, educated and understanding of other people's situations, um, those two factors have also uh, played a role in, in how we have approached different situations. Okay, um, so I, I want to do this um, in a way that to be mindful of a couple of things. I mean, obviously, uh, I want to look at a fair bit of data and statistics. And there's a little bit of uh, history in here, which, depending on your tastes, some people find history deadly boring, other people find it quite interesting. Um, so I don't want this to be too boring or data heavy. So I might skip through the next set of slides fairly quickly, but it does obviously set the, the context for, for what we're trying to say, and, and, and it is the, the bulk of the discussion. Um, so the way I've broken it up, um, broken our thoughts up, is just three main cohorts of ages. Uh, violence in the Biblical ages, uh, violence in the Middle Ages, and violence over the last 200 years. So looking at violence uh, in the Biblical ages, uh, Obviously, the Bible begins with the foundational premise of violent humans. Uh, uh, Cain killed Abel, a primeval human history that unfolds in Eden uh, is characterized by this uh, event. Um, we've got the vengeful cry of Lamech, um, who boasts of committing retribution against those who commit violence against him. And an entire episode of human history is finally sealed with the judgment in Genesis 6 that the earth was filled with violence. 
so you know it's it's certainly um, a very prevalent theme throughout the Bible. Um, and it's something that obviously uh, the Bible doesn't shy away from. Um, a really great piece of advice that somebody gave me years and years ago was always, he, he said to, uh, when, when, when trying to understand the Bible, um, it's, it's a book of contrasts and sometimes even contradictions. Um, and the best way to really get to grips with it is, is to understand that it's the the writings or the capturings of people as they struggle to get their relationship with God right. Um, and I think as we as we see it as a historical record of some of those events, um, we, we do see that people grappling with their relationship with God. But obviously the violence that's described in the Bible is obviously prevalent to the whole ancient Middle East at the time. Um, and you may see shades of uh, Hobbes's triangles starting to come out in this sort of thing. So the picture on the screen is a is a brass, uh, um, I don't want to call it engraving, but it's a, a piece of art um, from the Phoenician area. Um, and basically, uh, you can see um, the text that I've put on the screen that's come from one of the sources I looked up uh, they define um, the three main causes of violence in the Middle East to be those economic or territorial gains. Um, they're also very uh, aggressive in eliminating people that they decided should not exist. Uh, and there's also a lot of terrorizing of the enemy just to, just to keep them in place. So it's almost interesting that it kind of closely reflects Hobbes' triangle where those three forms of violence um, been to uh, either get territory, um, protect their territory, uh, or protect their reputation. And this uh, brass band that we see here is um, it comes from the, the Shelmanessa. Um, I'm not quite sure who he was, but um, it shows prisoners being tortured and dismembered. So obviously quite a, a gruesome time where violence was just taken for granted that that's the way things were done. Um, heads were beheaded and put on city walls, people were put on stakes, uh, hands and feet were chopped off. And it was it, it was the done thing. Um, it's the way it's the way way things happened. Um, now we obviously don't have a lot of data specifically from those times. Um, but what archaeologists are able to assess is that when they analyze the skeletons that they find, roughly 15% of the skeletons that have been found, 15% um, of those individuals have died from a violent death. So that's quite a high number. Um, you know, 15, 15 out of 100, uh, 150 out of 1,000. Um, so those are, those are fairly high numbers. Of course, it's... Um, as I say, it's it's not hard data, um, but it is it, it is uh, what archaeologists have been able to identify. And so, as we work through the Old Testament, um, it, it, it's one series of violent things after another. Uh, the Book of Judges is a violent serial epic. Um, after the death of Joshua, Israel is still at war with the Canaanites. There's an assortment of battles and heroic engagements. Um, the judges of Israel enact a tangled story of obedience and disobedience, and that's punctuated with shocking episodes of violence as well. Um, the establishment of an Israelite kingship is also accompanied by new episodes of violence, some which were sanctioned by God and some not. Um, the ideal king was conceived as a great warrior who maintained sovereignty by the threat of the sword. Um, Israel's ideal king was one who mirrored the heavenly kingship of God, shepherding his people, and yet defended them uh, heartily against predatory enemies. Um, but uh, it's still 
you know, we still see the story of Israel and Judah's kings, and they're strewn with streams of, uh, or scenes of violence that really do defy uh, God's covenant. Um, and obviously some of the most extreme cases being the product of pagan idolatry. Um, and I'm thinking of uh, examples like Ahab and Jezebel. So there is an incredible amount of unsanctioned violence um, that appears uh, in those times. So um, I'll leave these texts on the screen. I mean, you, you can read them, but the Bible describes some, some pretty horrific times. Um, and it makes does make you wonder um, how people reacted to violence in those days. You know, on the one hand, it seems like it was almost a part of life. But on the other hand, I'm sure that it must still have been an extremely horrific thing. Um, when, when these kinds of things happen. I mean, obviously, to some extent, they still happen today, and I'm not saying uh, that they don't. Um, but it just seems to be such a proliferation um, that we see the way that these things happen. Um, so it's, it's uh, violence against citizens and against ordinary people. Um, and in the case of military contexts, uh, they, they were just as bad. Um, you know, stabbings, limbs being cut off. We've already seen that brass band that I showed in an earlier slide. Um, you know, skulls, eyes punctured, bodies hanged, entire groups massacred, uh, and, and led into captivity, strung together with hooks through their lips. So there's some some pretty grim um, examples of of violence uh, throughout the Bible. Um, and by the time we get to the New Testament, it's not really a lot better. Um, you know, we've got the beheading of John the Baptist, which, again, I, you know, I'm, I'm not saying it wasn't a, a grim, a grim event, but it was something that was done uh, in, in, in a in, in what we could call high society. Um, as horrific as it was, it, it was done. Um, the crucifixion, uh, it was a very public spectacle of the way Christ died. Um, I, I have often thought that um, we, we know Christ had to die, um, but did it necessarily have to be by crucifixion? Uh, yet that was the way it was done at the time, um, and such an such incredibly public uh, display. Uh, there was the stoning of Stephen. Again, something done in public, dragged into the streets uh, and, and, and stoned. And then we've got the honor roll of Hebrews 11, um, which again uh, shows that you know, violence was, was very much a, a part of the way society uh, dealt with things. Um, whether people found it horrific or not, um, it was still very much part and parcel uh, of society. Hello. Just thought I'd check to see if anybody's still there. Um, so I'll just break up the slideshow a little bit because it is a bit of uh, death by PowerPoint. Ha oh, see what I did there. Um, but no, seriously, I, I do appreciate that there's a lot of a lot of slides and text. Um, so maybe this could be a good opportunity to hit the pause button, uh, go grab a cup of tea or some coffee or maybe a glass of wine, uh, and then come back, hit the resume button, and we'll crack on with the rest of the discussion. Okay, so now uh, let's look at violence in the Middle Ages. Um, I guess one of the reasons I've made the break like this between the Biblical times and Middle Ages is obviously from uh, in, in the Biblical aspect of it, we've got archaeology and we've got what was written in the Bible, uh, but we what we don't have are sort of statistics and data that can give us uh, a, a reference point. So effectively, what they give us is, is, if I can use the term, anecdotal. So we know that stuff happened. We know that a lot of stuff happened. We know that it was savage and brutal, um, but we don't exactly know what sort of percentages or numbers or or, or that sort of thing. But as we start getting into the Middle Ages, we, we do start having things being recorded. Um, and there's various ways that these uh, statistics and, and, and data points um, have been derived um, from, from court records, uh, from people's writings, um, obviously uh, accounts of, uh, of battles, 
uh, and that sort of thing. And a lot of quite interesting studies have been done. Um, obviously, uh, you know, one way to do it is to go through court records and see what trials were on and what they were for. Um, there's another group of scholars that sort of went through court records and did basically word searches and word clouds um, to see what the nature of violence was over time and how violence trended. Um, so that, that's the sort of source that a lot of these uh, data points have come from that, that we'll start to look at. Um, the, the little two little arrows on the screen there, um, you know, basically you've got 500 years from 900 to 1400 uh, and then another 600 years from that to today um, and you can see that the the, the numbers of, of of wars in Europe um, appear to be very similar so you've got a 500 year period you've got a 600 year period a very sort of similar number of of, of wars um, there's an interesting reason for that which I'll, I'll come to in a moment um, but the bottom line is um, what we're starting to see today are uh, more uh, frequent skirmishes but less deadly um, but I'll, I'll, I'll come to that later anyway um, so look let's let's start getting into this um, I found an interesting anecdote well sorry not anecdote an interesting reference in the Encyclopedia Britannica um, where they said that the premise of international law during the Middle Ages was that in an absence of an agreed state of peace War was the basic state of international relations between countries, um, and that even applied to Christian communities. So we, we're living, we're dealing with a time where it's just considered that we're at war uh, unless there's a peace treaty. So an interesting way of of looking at it. Um, and, and one historian even went to say that peace was regarded as a brief interval between wars. Um, so that's how that's how things were. What were they fighting over? Well, the three motives of quarrel as defined by Hobbes. So this is the period that, that Hobbes was writing about when he came up with those um, three principles of predation, um, preemption of predation or, or, or defense um, and uh, deterrence or, or honor. Um, guess what characterized um, a lot of the areas as we start to come into this period from a historical timeline is that um, we've sort of progressed from a lot of raiding and feudings at a tribal level of tribes, uh, knights, warlords, um, and we're starting to see uh, these warlords or I'm using the word states lightly, but they're becoming organized by political units um, rather than individuals or clans. It's, it's it's no longer about a clan or a family, but it's actually starting to become more of a, a state, more community-wide uh, time. Um, but we've still got conquest and plunder as the principal means of attaining wealth. Um, I mean, uh, basically, it was all about how you were able to plunder and retain land because that's where your wealth came from. Uh, the more land you controlled, uh, the wealthier you would be. And so that's what obviously drove a lot of the violence. Um, so this fellow, uh, Evan Lurd, um, he's uh, a British politician but also a very renowned historian and scholar on international relations so uh, in writing about the ages from the middle ages up until now he came up with these these five ages um, so I'm going to run through those uh, quite briefly because they they set a bit of a context for some of the graphs that I want to look at uh, that we'll, we'll come to shortly um, but just in terms of explaining what those those ages were so his first one was that that age of dynasties um, so that's what I've just been alluding to where violence is transitioning from oh, sorry society not necessarily violence uh, society is transitioning from these royal houses or, or clans they're starting to gather more strongly um, into coalitions and they're starting to vie for control of, of European turfs. Very, very dynastic approach to things. Um, 
so although uh, Lewis writings and, and what I'm about to discuss um, focuses very much on Europe um, from what I could see in the things that I, I researched uh, it's it's similar kinds of concepts around the world as well um, so I, I, I guess as um, civilizations were uh, maturing uh, and evolving um, the, these uh, concepts started to started to play out so we've got the age of dynasties um, and then what started to transition um, what what defined those coalitions merged into what Lord calls the age of religions where these coalitions were aligned along religious lines um, a, a principle of one king one law one faith um, started to become prevalent and these coalitions fought for control of cities and states uh, and this pr produced a, a tremendous amount of, of, of wars um, between states and internally as well um, this era sadly is quite notable for its killing um, partly because of advances in military technology um, pikes muskets artillery and so on um, um, but also because of uh, the way that religious warfare got extended to civilians um, so this is where singer's uh, expanding circle of empathy comes on where the minute you start putting something like a religious divide between communities um, people who are not of the same religious view uh, become people outside our empathy circle and therefore we feel um, no hesitation in doing violence towards them because well they just not in our circle so we don't really care um, so Lourd writes it was above all the extension of warfare to civilians who especially if they worshipped the wrong god were frequently regarded as expendable and this increased the brutality of war and the level of casualties appalling bloodshed could be attributed to divine wrath uh, for example the duke of alva had the entire male population of Narden killed after its capture and he regarded this as a punishment of God for their obstinacy in resisting him. Cromwell, who, having allowed his troops to sack Drogo with appalling bloodshed, declared that this was a righteous judgment of God. So there's this cruel paradox uh, that those who fought in the name of faith were often less likely to show humanity uh, to their opponents um, than to other people. So that age of religions, um, as you can see, roughly a hundred years of, of intense and, and savage bloodshed. We start to come then into the age of sovereignty, where the states are possibly still linked to dynasties and religions. But now uh, territories and governments are starting to take hold and become more established. Um, and this starts... A trend that we we see today um, where wars are less frequent but perhaps become a little bit more damaging um, perhaps one of the things that started the decline is that these states these sovereign states did get serious about war uh, so this meant that they improved weaponry uh, cannons guns uh, there was a recruiting more regular people um, into into the armies and these armies became professionally trained outfits rather than a uh, ragtag bunch of mercenaries and miscreants and, and, and other people that you could coerce into your violent escapades <clears throat> so obviously um, as these armies became more established more professionally trained uh, the threat of violence whilst ever present uh, started to diminish a little bit because the cost of war uh, would become a bit prohibitive um, in taking um, taking on another country um, and not necessarily as much gain uh, as they would have been in the past the age of nationalism um, is when the states started to become better aligned with nations 
Um, and these uh, nationalist yearnings are what basically started to either drive certain wars, um, and when they did, it was generally for some sort of independence or autonomy, um, and these national identities began to become established, um, and that's what we know a lot of today um, in these uh, what we, what we would call nation states, um, which are you know very identity oriented uh, these days. Um, this was also a period where there was a lot of colonization, um, and it's notable that people of Asia and Africa, as Luard says, were not deemed worthy of national self-expression, and so the European states enhanced their own glory by colonizing them. Um, so colonizing of, of uh, the African and Asian states uh, around the world. Lord ends his age of nationalism in 1917, uh, which was, uh, the reason why he says that is because that was the year that the United States entered uh, the First World War. Um, and therefore the First World War basically got rebranded um, as a, a struggle of democracy against autocracy um, and so it was no longer just about national identities anymore but it was actually about ideologies um, and so what we've started to see in the wars since the first world war and after this age of nationalism it's not so much about national identities anymore but it's about ideologies uh, we start thinking of anything that has an ism after it, like fascism and communism um, and any other kind of ism uh, that people tend to come up with these days. So those ages take us from a time of very, um, in the, starting in the age of dynasties, very ad hoc, very tribal, very, um, if I can call it community oriented violence. Um, and then back to Hobbes's triangle uh, at the top of that, that peak where as states become more established, uh, they take the, the ownership, if you like, of violence, um, um, either through religion um, being the, the, the reason for taking ownership of it, being at the top of that triangle, um, through then to the states who actually start to create their own armies um, and through the states they start to form a national identity, um, and then once we have states with national identities, we're starting to have these um, isms um, and ideologies that uh, start to define what 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 drives people's uh, points of view. Okay, this is where it gets really exciting for all the uh, statistics and data geeks amongst us. So, start to look at some of the metrics now. Okay. Um, so here's a, a straight comparison. Um, we'll, we'll dig into these a little bit more, um, but here's a one from uh, this historian Lauren Stone, um, who's noted that homicide levels in medieval England were about ten times what they are today, um, and he's using metrics where um, in 14th century Oxford, the homicide rate was 110. Per hundred thousand, so that's a metric that will that is used a lot. It's, it's a measure of x per hundred thousand. So for the most part, that's something that we'll see. Uh, that, that, that that's the number, the ratio that we'll see moving moving in. Um, com comparison in two thousand eleven, it was one per one hundred thousand, um, and I think the latest statistics in the UK, uh, it's one point two. Um, so um, yeah, to compare. 1.2 per 100,000 to 110 per 100,000, uh, that's obviously a lot a lot less um, death and mayhem. But we'll start to look now at, at some of the um, some of the data points uh, behind that. So looking at this chart, um, if you look closely, there's there's three there's three things on this chart. Um, the first one is you'll see a series of dots all over the place. Um, those dots are data that's been taken from either a particular town or jurisdiction um, and um, uh, historians have been able to pinpoint a specific number um, against that. Uh, there's a faint grey line running just over here which is in about 1820 uh, the UK 
started to keep regular data um, so that is why that is called the national data um, and then there's a dark black line which is put together by a historian um, fellow by the name of Coburn and he's compiled continuous data from the town of Kent um, from between 18, 1560 sorry 1560 uh, and 1985 and that's what he was able to that's why that is known as the Kent series um, because it's one town that has kept meticulous records um, since 1560 so yes um, let, let, let's be honest there, there is a little uptick there right so if we want to say violence is increasing since about 19 50, 1960, I suppose you could say yes, violence is on the increase um, over the last uh, 40, 50 years. But if we look at it as a trend overall, it's come down tremendously uh, compared to what it used to be. Um, and as I said, some of those numbers um, from that previous slide were almost 110 per 100,000, so that's even higher uh, off this chart. But the point to bring out of this graph is that um, there is still a tremendous downward trend. So if we are going to say things like violence is increasing, um, we, we need to be a bit more precise, a bit more careful, I think, in, in throwing away such, uh, such sort of throwaway lines because in relation to which period. Um, that same trend uh, applies uh, in Europe as well. We see a very similar trajectory. Uh, these lines are a little bit thin, so I, I hope they come out on the video. Um, but you can see that they are starting um, very high in around the 1300s, um, and they, they diminish tremendously um, over um, in, into recent times. They're, they're, they're a, a fraction of, of what they were. Um, the interesting one is, uh, is, is Italy, um, but there's, there's uh, reasons for that, a lot to do with um, criminal and, and, and gang and organized violence uh, in Italy. Okay, well let's start to look at violence now over the last 200 years. This is where it's getting, uh, I, I guess, a bit more defined. Obviously we've now got the, uh, I don't want to say luxury, but we, we have more reliable data sets that we can, st and, and more, more frequent data sets that we can start looking at to, to develop our argument. And it really is clusters of good and bad and, 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 and highs and lows. Um, so whilst I will talk about violence decreasing overall, uh, I am fully aware that we have clusters of bad, and I mentioned earlier, in some places like uh, Central America where there's a tremendous amount of drug and gang-related violence. We've got places like Africa. Um, we've got the Middle East with, with ISIS and terrorism, those sorts of things. So, yes, there, there, are, there are clusters of, of, of bad around the world, and, and, and they are very bad. So let's not, let's not downplay them. Um, what I am trying to look at is the overall situation around the world. Um, and so even though there are clusters of good and bad, um, I, I do want to focus on, on the overall situation. So there's a trend in warfare. Now this graph <coughs> is quite interesting. Um, again, you're looking at dots and lines and, and, and they mean nothing unless you, you've, you've got some context. But what it shows is that if you start by looking at this um, red line that's running across here, we'll see that for the most part, wars and rate of death per 100,000 people um, over set periods of time have remained relatively constant. When there's a war, people have died. I, I know that sounds a silly thing to say, but an obvious thing to say. But what, what we start to see it becomes more meaningful when we compare this red line uh, to the dots that we're seeing. So what we're starting to see, um, this was that period that I was talking about with um, the uh, age of religious wars, where there were lots of little wars, so there's a, a heavier cluster of dots there. Um, states become a little bit more organized, and that's where I was saying violence and wars were starting to drop. Uh, so there's there's a thinning out of the dots. 
And then as this age of nationalism came into play um, and transitioned into our age of ideologies and isms, you can see the dots starting to cluster up again and we're starting to see more and more dots. So religious phase, lots of wars, sovereign states, wars start to thin out. Um, and now as we get into this modern age, there, there's a lot more wars. What you're starting to see here is that the dots that represent wars become bigger and more significant. So although there's a little bit of a thinning out over here, it's because there was a Second World War and the First World War, tremendous amount of, of death through those wars. So whilst wars are becoming um, smaller, uh, there are also big wars that have a tremendous impact uh, on, on people uh, and, and the death rates. But what we've seen since the Second World War is a real falling off um, of war, and, and those are some of the reasons that, that we'll look at it at the moment. So again, I, I want to just bring us back to our, our premise about is violence increasing? So, you know, warfare and the death rate during warfare has something that has been fairly consistent. Um, and like all, all graphs, there's peaks and troughs and trends, and, and there's no doubt a time when this line will, will bounce up again. Um, so let, let's not fool ourselves and say that there will never be another, another war. Um, but the point is that at the moment, these, these lines are coming down. So I, I do think, uh, hence, hence the premise of what I'm saying, we need to be careful uh, when we just throw away lines like violence is decreasing, um, because these lines show that in recent times there's been a, a definite downward trend um, in, 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 in the statistics and in the data. One of the things, so I'm going to start looking now at the points that have, have led to this decline. Um, so we've got the leading up to these, these horrific wars here, the First World War and the Second World War, uh, and, and then what happened after that. In the 1800s, there was a curious attitude to war and a very romanticized view of military. I don't know, it's, it's, it's quite bizarre to read some of these things. Um, but you can see the quotes that I've put there, right? So war almost always enlarges the mind of people and raises their character. Um, and we must eat and be eaten so that the world might live. It's, 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 it's quite, you know, romanticized language about warfare. Um, I'm, I'm guessing probably written by people who've never had to actually be in the trenches. Um, you know, the, the grandeur of war lies in the utter annihilation of the puny man. In the great conception of the state, it brings up the full magnificence of the sacrifice of fellow countrymen for one another, the love, the friendliness, and the strength of mutual sentiment. So these were very much the pervading attitudes at the turn of the century um, that, that, that led us um, from that time of nationalism uh, and building up, to, building up to the First World War. Um, but after the First World War, uh, there was very much a change of heart. Um, the, the propaganda started to go away from the sort of things that we see on the screen. If England falls, you fall. Um, you know, it was very jingoistic. Um, but after the First World War, it was no longer seen as a glorious, heroic thing anymore. Um, it was considered moral. It was repulsive, it was futile, it was stupid, it was wasteful. Um, there was no longer any value in going to war. Um, if you recall, I said in some one of the earlier slides that one of the main drivers of wealth was being able to plunder other states. Well, that was no longer possible. And in fact, wars just became um, incredibly uh, expensive and, and wasteful exercises. Um, and especially when people considered the causes that, that led to the First World War. Um, if you remember, one of Hobbes's three things was the protection of people's reputations. And really, the immediate cause of World War I was a showdown over honor. Um, the leaders of Austria and Hungary had issued a humiliating ultimatum to Serbia that it should apologize for the assassination of the Archduke. Russia took offense on behalf of its fellow Slavs. Germany took offense at Russia's offense. 
And then as Britain and France joined in, it became a contest of face, of humiliation, stature, and everyone's credibility was on the line. So the fear of being reduced to a second-rate power uh, in Europe is what made everybody really gun up uh, and, and, and take, take each other on. Um, and as we know, it was uh, an incredibly uh, wasteful exercise. So just exploring more of this demise of these of these numbers um, there's another graph that I'm going to look at here which is battle deaths of these state-based conflicts so I'm going to start using this term state-based and I'll explain why in a moment but this is obviously conflicts of state on state and it's what we expect to see uh, there's, there's a horrific spike in World War One there's a horrific spike in World War Two um, but once we get those two wars behind us, uh, you can see that this line falls away. And there has been a period which uh, historians are starting to call the long peace. Um, again, no one's saying that there won't be another spike at some stage, um, but they are referring to this period as, as, as the long peace. But it, it does mean that the nature of war has changed. Um, so what this graph is trying to show, it's the similar, similar numbers that we're seeing here. It's starting at this piece uh, after the Second World War. So it's that same period. Um, so we're seeing that same fallout. But what we're seeing is the, the blue lines of the wars between states have, have almost started to, to fall away um, after and we're starting to see a lot more civil war in these orange and yellow lines um, materialize. So a, a lot of civil and internal strife um, starting to appear in these major state-based wars. That's obviously uh, Vietnam um, and these wars um, falling away. So I'm put two graphs together, um, more war but less war. So this is, I guess, another dig and explanation of why we're seeing more clusters of dots here. Um, what we're seeing in this graph is these colonial or interstate wars um, are falling away after the Second World War. So after 1946, these wars are falling away. Uh, there's been a little bit of civil war that's become internationalized where other players have got involved but it's primarily still a civil war but what we are seeing is a tremendous amount of civil war um, where basically countries are starting to tear themselves apart um, so think of uh, north and south sudan think of uh, bosnia herzegovina and, and, and those kinds of things um, where we saw, saw a lot of civil war for um, national identities and, and basically what created those differences or between them was their uh, various ideologies. So we're back into that state of isms. So although we've seen the numbers of wars rise, uh, the number of conflicts has, has increased uh, up until that period before falling away, uh, the death rate has come down. So back to this chart of battle deaths per conflict, and we can see how the number of deaths are really falling away. So this is just illustrating that point that I made earlier um, that, um, you know, if there was ever a time to be alive uh, and, and as a human being less fearful for your life, this is it um, because of the way death rates uh, are, are declining. Right. So let's recap our research question. Is violence increasing? Funkum or Dinkum. Um, based on the graphs and the st statistics that we have seen, uh, both in terms of warfare and violent crime like homicide, uh, we'd have to say it's Bunkum. Violence is not increasing. Um, we are going through a period at the moment where violence is, is declining. Uh, it's the decline of violence. Um, if uh, I'm going to bring up one of the statements that I used earlier, um, just to make a point. Um, so this was from one of uh, the 
Crystal Delphine websites that I mentioned, and this was the statement that the varying solutions in which the wise men of the 19th century have put their trust have all been exposed as false. More widespread education has not been followed by higher moral standards, but by growth in dishonesty, greed, violence, and crime. So, uh, as you can see, what I've done there is highlighted the statement, uh, the, the implication that the statement is making, right? So what, we, what that statement is basically saying is more widespread education may exist, but it has been followed by a growth in dishonesty, greed, violence, and crime. Um, I'm going to rate that as bunkum, um, because uh, as we've seen from the graphs, um, that dishonesty, greed, violence, and crime has always been there. Um, and it, if anything, the outworkings of that in terms of the violence and the crime has diminished tremendously. It's interesting to put two graphs side by side. Um, again, these are really skinny little lines, so I, I do hope they show up on the video. But what we're looking at at the graph on the left is literacy rates uh, since 1475. And, and we can see how literacy rates have increased to almost 100% literacy uh, by 2003. In comparison, we see the graph that I used earlier of homicide rates in Europe and how homicide rates have declined. So I think when making statements like that, we need to be really careful to get our data and our facts correct, particularly in the public domain, because people can read and see a statement like that. They can easily see statements and charts like that, which simply do not support that. Uh, and so we need to be really careful about the kinds of things that we say. So yes, like I said, there's, there's clusters of good and bad. Um, and all through this, um, while I was doing this research, the one area that I kept coming back to, because I, I just find it such an incredible enigma, is, is the states. And we're always hearing of, you know, uh, street shootings and, and police shooting people, and, you know, it really does seem like the Wild West over there. Um, but this chart was an interesting one from the FBI. So even since over the last 20 years, basically, violent crime in the US is dropping. Uh, and that's as noted by the FBI. So this is not somebody who's necessarily got a, <laughs> an axe to grind, but it does show that, yes, crime rates are still incredibly high. In, in this instance, we're talking violent crime, such as assault, uh, rape, um, that sort of thing. And they're talking about a figure of uh, three, over 300 per 100,000. But it is still on the decrease. So again, when we're saying things like violence is on the increase, we need to be careful because it's not entirely true. Um, it may be in some areas of the world, um, but for the most part, uh, it's not. So what are some lessons that we can learn from these? Um, I often find one of the reasons I enjoy studying topics like this is because it gives me uh, a different headspace, um, and I often find things that I can relate back to ecclesial life, and, and this is one of those those times when uh, I've been able to do that. Admittedly, it's a bit of a dark topic, all right, violence and, and ecclesial life, so uh, please please take where my comments are coming from uh, in, in, in the right spirit, um, but there are some lessons that we can learn. Um, and I, I, I firmly believe that once we are able to recognize and understand certain things, we're able to deal with them better. Uh, so this is not intended to be um, me getting up on a soapbox. It's, it's, I am trying to make some observations here um, and, and, not, and not get uh, self-righteous and, and, and judgmental about things. Um, but like I said, there, there, there are some, some lessons we, we can learn. One of the things I noticed that came up in this is something called the democracy theory. And there's an interesting statistic um, in, in wars at the moment that no two democracies have gone to war against each other. So in all the wars that we've seen to date, they have always been, uh, yes, a democracy may have been involved in the war, um, but not against another democracy. Uh, it's always been a democracy against some or other ism. Um, I'm 
immediately my mind went to England and Argentina back in the 80s, but at that time Argentina wasn't a democracy. Uh, so I, I found that an interesting little um, an interesting little thought. Um, but if we take that statement and replace democracies with ecclesias, um, ecclesias don't fight each other because of the ideals they share in common. Um, so I think it, it, it brings home that point that we really should be making every effort to expand those circles of empathy uh, and understand other, other ecclesias' uh, motives. Um, there, there may be a, a lot less inter-ecclesial strife um, if we could expand those empathy circles sometimes um, and, and be a bit more realistic in what we expect of, of one another. Um, I'm finding that particularly relevant now where, I mean, let's just be honest, in the current situation, there's been a lot of gloom mongering and fear mongering about uh, how the world is changing because of coronavirus. Um, this would be a really good time for a lot of ecclesias to put aside their differences uh, and, and start to find ways to, to come together because of the ideals that we share in common. Um, Hobbes's trio of motives, um, putting this one in an ecclesial context. Um, so Stephen Pinker wrote this point and he said, the cognitive habit of treating people as instances of a category gets truly dangerous when people come into conflict. It turns this trio of violent motives, gain fear and deterrence, from the bones of contention of an individual quarrel to a casus belli. Uh, casus belli is an excuse for war. Um, and that's what we find so often. Um, Ecclesias find uh, the most crazy casus belli uh, to go to war with each other. Um, and really, it's you can debate who's the aggressor and who's the victim as much as we like. What we are doing at an ecclesial level is each one is pretending to know what the law, the bystander, i.e. Christ, uh, would think of it and um, um, you know basing our actions upon how we perceive Christ's perspective of the situation so we're, we're kind of almost uh, overriding what is written in the scripture and, and replacing with our interpretation of how we think Christ should behave it becomes interesting um, in some of the the other things that Stephen Pinker wrote um, and looking at, at the the aggressiveness of religion um, in in violence uh, throughout the ages um, and he's he said that uh, and now I'm, I'm quoting uh, Pinker's Pinker's writing uh, a broader danger of unverifiable beliefs is the temptation to defend them by violent means people become wedded to their beliefs because the validity of those beliefs reflects on their competence commends them as authorities and it rationalizes their mandate to lead. Challenge a person's beliefs and you challenge his dignity, his standing and power. And when those beliefs are based on nothing but faith, they are chronically fragile. When people organize their lives around these fragile beliefs, they react to unbelief with rage. And that's why they suppress speech, writing uh, and association. So that was, uh, I think, a, a good way of putting what I said, where although the scriptures tell us to esteem one another better than ourselves, um, we tend to become wedded to beliefs and defend them by violent means because sometimes they're built on very, very fragile foundations. Uh, and so it gets to the stage where, uh, yeah, um, violent reactions, I'm not necessarily saying fisticuffs, um, but, but certainly uh, aggressive reactions uh, are what result. And it becomes particularly more dangerous. Um, Pinker goes on to describe this cognitive habit that people have of categorizing. Uh, and this is where that empathy circle comes into it again, where the minute we can put a label around somebody, we can uh, remove them from one layer of the empathy circle to another. Um, uh, Hitler was a very good, yes, Godwin's law, I've brought Hitler into it. Um, Hitler was very good at 
he's mixing his metaphors where he described the Jews as viruses. They were blood-sucking parasites. They were a mongrel race. They were poisonous blood. And I've seen a lot of that sort of rhetoric um, in some of our ecclesial, um, not, not, not Halifax Street, I've got to stress that, um, but in, in a lot of ecclesial writings where people have had um, communities, uh, have had names and derogatory labels applied to them. People have been described as having blood on their hands uh, in, in, a way, in a way to identify them and put them in a box so that they can be classed as a category of people uh, therefore that to which aggression and violence can legitimately be shown so there's that the, the castus belli coming into it and there's all sorts of behaviours which um, are as old as time and as much as we talk about the decline of violence uh, or, or, or violence increasing um, we tend to do just the same thing sometimes uh, within our community so it's it's a nature of human life um, so yes you know, back to back to Thessalonians. Um, whilst we're dealing with this this human nature, um, we do really pray for that time when Christ will return. And like I said at the start, although I've um, put forward the the proposition, which I, I do I do believe violence is declining. Um, let's not get complacent. Um, Thessalonians warns us that there will be peace and security. Um, before the time of the end um, but Thessalonians also says that we are to be sober put on a breastplate of faith and hope love and encourage one another and build one another up so that brings us to the end of uh, end of the discussion um, as I said at the beginning I did find it a far more interesting uh, book and topic of research than I was expecting. Um, it was something I thought I would just use to pass away the time and it actually ended up being quite an interesting study for me. Um, I hope I was able to bring that across in some of the things that, uh, that we looked at. So we're going to close now uh, with a hymn. Uh, this time it's one that I found on the Seventh Day website. Uh, I'll post a link to that website during the video uh, while the hymn plays. Um, but this was a song called This Mind in Us, written by uh, Alethea Burney and Phil Rosser. So thank you for joining me. Um, I hope that you all have a good and positive week ahead. I, I know times can be difficult uh, in this social isolation that we are practicing at the moment, um, but hopefully events and activities such as this will help us to feel um, connected and still uh, uh, part of the community. So thank you um, and, and have a good week.